one. Thank you for inviting us to participate in the 18th International Conference on the Arts and Society. My name is Sylvia Honorado, and I'm currently a PhD candidate in the English Department at Princeton University. And I'm Christina Honorado. I recently graduated from the University of Notre Dame with a Bachelor of Fine Arts degree. Many modernist paintings include corporate trademarks, the titles of established papers, and other aspects of branding. But paradoxically, they are either blurred or cut off. It seems counterintuitive to present something that relies on clarity and then render it unrecognizable. In this talk, we plan to explore how Impressionists and Post-Impressionists like Edouard Manet and Vincent van Gogh used blurred labels to create an ambiance of timelessness, including marketing symbols and artistic gesture that both complements other aspects of the painting and maintains a cohesive style. We will then contrast them with the Cubists like Juan Gris and Pablo Picasso, who will crop product names to make them only partially legible in a way that adds to the frenetic feeling of their art and allows for more targeted commentary on both the evolving socioeconomic landscape and the prerogative of art to confront modern opportunities and challenges alike. Brands are promises, relationships between corporate em entities and, ma and the masses. Philip Kotler, a world-leading authority on marketing, and Gary Armstrong, an award-winning undergraduate business teacher, claim that a brand is a name, term, sign symbol, or a combination of these that identifies the maker or seller of the product. It is a visual identity that can create meaning and recognition with its target audience. Brands are powerful and done correctly can communicate their identity to the public clearly. Two artists on the fringes of Impressionism, Manet and Van Gogh, produced work that is clear enough to have identifiable subject matter and abstract enough to make the brands pictured therein unidentifiable. Manet usually preferred not to exhibit his work alongside the Impressionists, but is nevertheless identified with them as he was among the first to help complicate realism. His 1886 still life with melons and peaches seems very realistic from a distance, but up close, the brush strokes are barely blended. By zooming in on the melon, we see how he conveys the raw impression of the fruit without mixing colors. If we also zoom in on the bottle, we can see that this label is blank. Was there supposed to be a brand there? The linear ruddy swatches seem to indicate so, though it is impossible to tell if they are meant to be faintly reminiscent of writing or a rectangular logo. In the context of the still life as a whole, it holds the same le level of importance, or lack thereof, as the dappling on a melon. The dynamo that was economic modernization fits comfortably and unobtrusively into a little white slash. So, why have it there at all? This painting is all but black and white, even though the canvas is divided into two sides, one light and one dark. The label stands as a suture between the two parts and is positioned in such a way that it adds height to the painting. On the whole, it makes the composition much more dynamic. In addition to serving an aesthetic purpose, it calls to attention our urge to label things we see. The single flower, the spilling grapes, the suggested peach in the foreground, etc., could have any number of meanings, though symbolism was against the aims of more canonical Impressionists. It is tempting to affix labels to all the objects in the still life that do not have them. It is tempting to create counterfeit in our search for meaning. Instead of offering us a clinical and prescriptive summary of what is contained in both the bottle and the scene, Manet preserves the enigmatic charm of the painting by leaving the one label that is present blank, simultaneously offering and denying meaning. But what if the brand were somewhat recognizable, like the red triangle on the bottles in a bar at Folle Bergere? The words are unreadable, but the shape is iconic. The red triangle is in fact the logo for the Bass and Company's Pale Ale, founded in 1777 by William Bass. It became the largest brewery in the world in just a decade. Its trademark, the red triangle you see on Manet's painting not once, but twice, is the first ever trademark filed under the Trademark Registration Act of 1875. Six years later, Manet included the Bass Triangle in this painting, widely considered one of the, la the last major paintings he completed during his lifetime. Yet another detail multiple art critics have taken note of is the corsage of the barmaid's dress. The color and shape of the flower simulates the Bass logo. BBC culture writer and published author Kelly Grovier writes, by stamping the chest of his painting's protagonist with an unauthorized replica of the Bass logo, Manet not merely marks her out as a consumable product to be bought and sold, he reduces her value further still by implying that her very existence is as disposable as a cheap counterfeit. 
The fact that the barmaid is in the center of two vast ale bottles equates her to just another commodity on the bar top. This begs the question of what Manet considers a product in this painting. Could it not be just inanimate items, but humans as well? Is the barmaid the equivalent of an object in a still life? If she is, then so is the artist. He signs his name on a red bottle at the far left. Given that Bass was one of the first companies to legally claim its trademark, perhaps the placement of Manet's name indicates authenticity and credibility, even if it does efface individuality. Manet's name stands for more than Manet himself. He becomes his own brand. Van Gogh influenced many art movements in his lifetime. He is primarily known as a post-impressionist and the father of expressionism. His early work, like Manet's, is a blend of realism and bold, unblended brushstrokes. In one still life titled uh, Still Life with Two Sacks and a Bottle, the eponymous objects are fairly clear, but the blue brand on the most prominent sack is unreadable. Interestingly enough, practically none of the scholarly articles published on this um, painting in English identify the brand or the contents of the sack. From the manner in which the sack folds, it seems to be made of cloth rather than paper. In the Netherlands in the 1800s, dry goods were often stored in jute sack, a type of cloth that was fairly cheap and durable and could be recycled into various other useful items. Van Gogh actually painted some of his masterpieces on jute as did his friend Paul Gauguin. If the bag is jute, what could it contain? From the flat planes of, of the paint, it seems that the contents are not overly lumpy. Perhaps it could be sugar, flour, or a fine grain. Of the few flour jute sacks that have been saved and digitized by the Bakery Museum in Belgium, the labels look similar um, uh, to this uh, one in the Van Gogh painting. They tend to be black or dark blue, circular, and composed almost entirely of words. One uh, word that often has is the Dutch uh, word for molens or mill, and another is the name of the town. The writing on Van Gogh's bag is in a smaller print than on the museum's digitized meal sacks and jute sacks though, so the mystery prevails. Despite the ambiguity, it is clear that the contents of the bag is an ingredient waiting to be cooked. When we look at the full bag, we see potential, we see nourishment, and Van Gogh sees a canvas, but the inside will not feed us, nor the outside become art without labor. To understand what kind of bag this is, our eyes essentially have to become the bakers with the help of the Gestalt effect. Johanna Drucker defines the Gestalt effect as our tendency to not perceive things literally. In several of the illusions on the right side of the slide, you may see shapes where they do not exist by closing the gaps between dots and lines. In the one circled in blue, you might perceive two triangles made partially of negative space. And in the one circled in red, you might see a tree. Applying this principle to the Van Gogh painting, we can see two curves coming together to form an illusory oval around the squiggles that look like and could potentially be writing. Altogether, this is not a logo when perceived literally and close up any more than Sarah's luncheon on the grass is a luncheon. But when viewed far away, it gives the impression of a certain mill stamp big enough to let the location remain unknown and familiar enough to make the viewer recognize the bag. This is an image of plenty, a scene featuring ingredients which, with a little work, could be both edible and edifying. Van Gogh could have written clearly had he wanted to, as demonstrated in Still Life with a Plate of Onions. The book on the table has a title and an author, which are not only legible, but correspond to an actual text. So if the book and the letter below it add to the charm of this still life, why obscure the logo in the other one? How does the decision to make the mill brand generic add to this still life? One answer could be that it creates a moment out of time and place. It is set in our world and in a genre of painting that is traditionally quite worldly. But by teasing the viewer with an unreadable message, the goods that could be from somewhere become goods from anywhere, or at least any of the countless towns with mills and standardized sacks. Unlike Manet and Van Gogh, Cubist painters like Pablo Picasso and Juan Gris included legible letters in their work. This made it easier for the viewers to identify the companies and allowed for the art to capitalize on the connotation they hold politically and economically. But like members of earlier movements, the words were often cut off. Picasso's still life with chair caning is unique in that it is both a collage and a Cubist painting. He pasted a piece of oil cloth pre-printed with chair caning pattern to the canvas, then painted on top of it and added a rope around the periphery. 
By doing this, he plays with the table-tableau dichotomy. According to Christine Poggi, the tableau is the vertical plane of the painting. Through the tableau, we can see the table or the horizontal plane. Because the two planes are not clearly separated in Picasso's painting, he complicates the binary between object and subject, frame and framed. Similarly, presses and newspapers frame the world in such a way that the stories they present can become the world. The letters J-O-U are from the title of a Parisian newspaper. Choosing a certain paper is the same as choosing a certain version of the world. Just as pasting an object onto a canvas makes that object a subject. There were many journals in Paris at the turn of the century, like the Journal des Debats or the Petit Journal. We know the one Picasso is referring to with the letters J-O-U is simply titled Le Journal, because the title and articles pictured in other works of his, like uh, Guitar and Wine Glass, are, are copied verbatim from that publication. Le Journal is a French newspaper that began in 1892. It was, according to French journalist Simon Albayo, the most Parisian, the most literary, and the most boulevardier of the newspapers of Paris. Under the founder Fernand Xu's guidance, the newspaper reached the widest audience possible while also attracting the literary elite of the Times, a popularity that remained for the rest of Le Journal's time of production. According to New York Times journalist Jason Farrago, Le Journal was a daily filled with literary essays, society gossip, and true crime. Due to coverage of scandalous political intrigue, Le Journal was used in many Cubist artists' pieces. This can be seen in the classic use of spliced cuttings from Le Journal issues. Of course, Le Journal was not the only French newspaper being devoured by the public, but it managed to stand out as a personal favorite of Cubists. The choice to include only three letters accomplishes several things. It invites a number of puns in French and affords the letters their own aesthetic value as signifiers divorced from a single assigned meaning. According to Susan Marcus, Jou may alternately be finished as jouer to play, jouir to enjoy, and jouter to joust. All of these verbs could refer to still life with chair caning, where the playfulness and enjoyment come from the way different elements joust with each other uh, to both share and synthesize a unique space. And those are only the verbs. There are plenty of other possibilities, like bijou, jewel, which would be relevant because Picasso challenges us to rethink what is precious by both elevating quotidian objects to the level of art and representing them in a new style that is delightfully disorienting, equally mesmerizing and abrasive. These puns would, in part, rely on letters that are not pictured in the collage. While the three letters Picasso chose invite this, they do not require it to be meaningful. As the artist said in a 1923 interview, cubism is not either a seed or a fetus, but an art dealing primarily with forms. And when a form is realized, it is there to live its own life. If Zhu is fully sprouted and fully grown, then it could simply be Zhu, no more and no less. While it could be a puzzle, it is not one that needs to be solved to be complete. It is complete in its incompleteness. Among the many cubists who used Le Journal was Juan Gris. He included the entire title in his painting, Still Life with Checked Tablecloth. Unlike Picasso, there's no ambiguity whatsoever about the publication though the articles themselves are difficult to see, unlike in other Gris paintings in which he had copied large portions on the front page. The label that poses a mystery in this piece is the one uh, up on one of the wine bottles in the upper um, uh, left corner. Uh, let's see. Uh, and it has the letters E-A-U. In French, U means water, but the bottle most likely contains wine. So the three letters are probably part of a word like Beaujolais, Bune, or Bordeaux. Gris uh, transforms water into wine, essentially performing his own version of the wedding at Cana, as Robert Rosenblum wittily observes in an essay on cubism and typography. The conversion from water to wine is not the only thing that changes about this painting. The forms themselves overlap in such a way that they create other forms. The white outline of a cup on a table can also be the snout of a bull, complete with a black and white eye higher up, 
horns that look like wisps of steam, and a horizontal wine bottle that doubles as the contour of the jaw. Fittingly, the French word for bull, uh, taureau, contains eau. Of the three brands pictured, one is outside the bull and two are inside of it. Could there be any significance to the placement of these brands? Le Journal, the lowest of the three, is reproduced faithfully on the table. It is on level with a stable surface which supports everything above it. Higher up, the Bass Ale logo on the bull's halter is highly realistic but partially clipped. The highest of the brands, the U inside the bull, is most mutable of all, both semantically and as a brand. In order from lowest to highest, the brands become less clear. The bull made of glassware, alcohol, and steam seems to swirl up from the plane of the table in Le Journal. The articles inside could inspire thoughts that rise at the sense of the strong drinks on the table. The phrase eau de, when, compared, when paired with an object, means the scent of. So if the bowl and all sensations it contains appear to waft up from Le Journal, maybe the whole upper part of the painting seeks to construct an air or ambiance derived from the publication. Further, the journal was a staple of Cubist art. It could show how an international community of artists inspire each other to etherealize the mundane, to take the shapes from the checkerboard void of the room and rearrange them to make a still life that dares viewers to question the nature of reality. Gris complicates the theme of mass production that dominates modern art by making a painting that is equally about reproducibility and mutability. The bass extra stout harkens back to Monet's famous painting, but instead of a red triangle, Gris has chosen a red diamond, not so subtly indicating that modern art has evolved since then. Just as the logo has changed, so has art with the advent of new movements. The placement of this logo at the halter around the bull's neck shows how past movements have driven future ones, perhaps by guiding them, perhaps by teaching them to crave freedom. Gris's work shows how creative recombination thrives in a world that is starting to become dominated by mass production. The painting presents an optimistic outlook on economic modernization with its dynamic composition and its bright colors uncharacteristic of other Cubist works of the time, particularly Picasso and Brock's synthetic and analytical styles. It is a painting that makes miracles, converting water to wine, lines to curves, and copies into originals. Blurry brands can have a number of meanings depending on the artist's movement. Manet reveals to us our own urge to label by showing us a blank label. Van Gogh invites us to create what we think we see using visual psychology. Picasso shows us that letters themselves can have tremendous associative meaning without compromising aesthetic value. And Gris uses logos to let his art participate in an ongoing dialogue with other canonical works. Each in their own way shows how mass production and originality are not necessarily antonyms and how the arrangement of mundane objects with a creative flair allows us to see marketing both as a contributor to art and its own kind of art. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Mizar, we're excited. Enjoy the conference. <laughs>